Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Susanna Barcella today from Fordham University. Uh, Dr. Barcella earned her PhD um, in Italian from the Johns Hopkins University, but do not let her humanities cloak fool you. She was, as some as you may be, in the Honors College, an economics major in college, and she even went on to earn, I believe, an MPhil in economics at uh, the University of York. Those of you who know the Divine Comedy well can imagine certain monetary or financial passages that may have uh, made her decide to change <laughs> her course of study. Um, Dr. Bersala's work is really interdisciplinary. It draws um, upon philosophy, it draws upon theology, it draws upon art history, it even bridges well beyond uh, the Middle Ages. She's published on Dante, on Petrarch, on Boccaccio, on Michelangelo, and on the idea of the work from antiquity to the Middle Ages. But she's also interested in more modern writers um, like uh, Gada and Pirandello, whom some of you will recognize as the Italian dramatist who is a sort of forerunner of the theater of the absurd and won the Nobel Prize in the early 20th century. Um, her book, In Light of the Angels, is, at least to my limited knowledge of Dante, but I believe this is true, uh, really the first work to explore extensively the role of angels in the Divine Comedy. Uh, and I'm very excited to welcome her here today to speak to us about art and theology in the Divine Comedy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your very generous and nice introduction. Uh, uh, can I call you Sarah Jane, or then Dr. Morris Formal, and for your generous presentation. I'm really honored to be here in this very prestigious Dante uh, series, like uh, Dante lecture series. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, our. Uh, the patron of the arts, Dr. Penn, so really very much uh, continuing a tradition uh, from humanism to Renaissance in these very days. So I'm very grateful uh, being also a scholar in humanism. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, um, all those who have uh, been so kind to invite me here. And um, so Dr. Philip Donnelly, the director of the Great Text uh, Program, Dr. Uh, Dean uh, Thomas uh, Hibbs uh, of uh, the uh, Honors College, uh, Dr. Sarah Jane Murray, uh, the chair of the Dante Lecture Series and the committee composed by Dr. Uh, Minor, Will Dr. William Weaver, uh, Dr. Michael Folly uh, members of this committee, so I'm really grateful and, uh, and again I'm honored and thank also to all the students and colleagues uh, that are here and have the patience to, uh, to be with me along this uh, uh, journey, which I hope is not too long uh, in the Divine Comedy, looking at the arts and theology work today. So thank you. Uh, I go in medias res. Although the poetry of the Divine Comedy has been extensively analyzed and its hermeneutical, philosophical, and theological implications, the aspect of poetry as techne, or as production process requiring science and skills, has received relatively, if not little, attention. In Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, as many of you know, techne indicates the intellectual virtue related to human production. During the Middle Ages, the ethical input of production gradually developed into a theological perspective in which art became a fundamental moment in the human participation in the economy of salvation. By investigating Dante's idea of poetry in its relationships with the theory of art and the theology of work displayed in the Commedia, I would like to show uh, how Dante builds on this tradition and eventually redefines the <coughs> Oh my God, <laughs> redefines poetry as a theology of techno. That's what I was missing. In Dante's poem, not only artistic production retains the ethical essence of techne, but also it becomes an act of concrete realization of charity, and we will see how. And as such, as essential as praxis, the action, uh, in the progress uh, towards salvation. This eschatological perspective finds its center, I argue, in the ethical, aesthetical notion of excellence and in the poet's role as scriba, scribe, to whom a higher divine force of inspiration dictates. 
The investigation of the main passages in which and canters in which Dante addresses and questions the notion of scriba, from now on, scribe, excellence and theological works, cast new light, in my opinion, on the ethical eschatological essence of Dante's poetry. Now, the first step into this intellectual journey moves from the analysis of the very premise of Dante's voyage and its implications on the artistic theory the poem displays, particularly referring to the cantos 10 to uh, 12 of Purgatore. Dante's voyage finds its ultimate justification, as we all know, in the virgin's choice of the poet to write what he sees on his journey through the realms of afterlife, so that he may enlighten and guide others in the pursuit of virtue. Now, this tropological claim we find stated directly or indirectly in many different places in the poem is correlated to the salvific power of this journey. And both eschatological and ethical perspectives hinge on the material production of Dante's <coughs> inspired art. A distinguishing trait of this art uh, is the fact that Dante renounces its real authorship, the authorship of the poem. The ultimate source of inspiration of the truths it, it contains is not just the imagination of the poet, but God's creative mind. Dante, faithful reporter of the marvels, seeing his, in his divinely ordained vision, states his appointed task as scriba at crucial passages in the Commedia. After the sequence of the chariot's metamorphosis in Purgatorio 33, for example, Beatrice solicits her ancient lover to report to the living, and this is your first quote, uh, Segna Avivi, her prophetic words without alteration, come da noi son porte, or omissions, non ce l'ha, tu nota, e si come da me son porte, così queste parole segna vivi, del viver che incorrere alla morte, e agiamente quando tu le scrivi, di non ce l'ha, quale hai vista la pianta che or due volte ti rubata qui. Beatrice's command would seem to provide the hermeneutical key for interpreting the meaning of Dante's response to Bonagiunta Orbiciani in Purgatorio 24, where Dante defines his own poetry and to which we will come back. Uh, she does so by drawing on the terms nota and scrivi, write, presented here within a, an expansion of the semantic field to include segna, nota, which is also ambiguous because it's already image, segnare, it's also sign. The writer must take note of Beatrice's words and render them faithfully so that they can be signs for the readers, images and symbols of divine truth. At this stage of Dante's coming toward restoration of natural perfection in Purgatorio, Beatrice is the voice that dictates to Dante. However, she is not the source from which love breathes its words. In reassessing Dante's obligation to write only what she speaks, Beatrice indirectly defines both the poet and his poem as instrumental to a superior divine end. Now, the idea of Dante relative passivity as scribe emerges again and even in a more cogent form in Paradiso 10, where the poet informs the reader about his own task in illustrating the mysteries he has been called upon to describe. Second poet, Messo to dinanzi, o mai per te ti ciba, che a se torce tutta la mia cura, quella materia un dio son fatto scriba. The use of a passive verb here calls attention to the nature, the quality of the term scriba, the passivity, son fatto, I am made. It marks an essential trait of the fictional writer in the Commedia, which, however, is also central to Dante's idea of poetry as self-perfectioning process in image and likeness of divine creation. The authority of the poem, and therefore its success, of course, relies upon two main things then the identification of its original source with divine inspiration, and the consequent necessity of the poet's detachment, dispossessment of his own text. Only by renouncing authorship in this sense can the poem truly become sacred and the poet escape the dangers of intellectual idolatry implicit in the identification of the poieteos, intended as the material constructor, the artifacts, uh, of the literary artifact. And 
of the identification, identification of these proietos with his own work. The true author resides beyond the reality that the poem represents. Yet, rather than diminishing the authority of the poet, such detachment shifts it into the sphere of art. After all, Dante is made scribe in virtue of the qualities of his poetic skills and of the aesthetical and intellectual power, uh, power of his poetry. These qualities are crucial to penetrate and survive the dangers of his journey, as hinted from the very beginning of the Commedia by Beatrice's request to Virgil to assist Dante with his honest and beautiful words, the two words that you follow. Or movi, con la tua parola ornata e con ciò che ammestieri al suo campare, l'aiuta sì che ne sia consolata. Venni qua giù del mio beato scanno, fidandomi del tuo parlare onesto, con ora te e quei cudito l'anno. In addressing the author of the Enaid, Beatrice points at two main elements of Virgil's poetry his parlare onesto and his parola ornata. If the first defines Virgil as the cantor, the singer of virtue and devotion, the second captures the aesthetic essence of the Virgilian word, the excellence of his language. These two elements cannot be separated and encapsulate together the meaning and value of Virgil's role <coughs> as Dante's guide. His poetic language affects an ideal coherence between form and content and constitute, at this point of his journey, Dante's model. Aesthetic is, in other words, necessary for virtue, to be effectively assimilated so as to serve as an internal guide and a stimulus to act. Poetic excellence, moreover, informs as well the argument St. Lucy utilizes in exhorting Beatrice to undertake the rescue of her ancient lover. Beatrice, Beatrice, lode di Dio vera, che non soccorri quei che t'amo tanto, cusci per te dalla volgare schiera. Why don't you help this guy who, you know, wrote wonderful uh, poetry for you, and because of that stood upon above everybody else. Lucy's words suggest Dante's superiority with respect to other vernacular rhymers, the volgare schiera. And this superiority may well consist in his ability to harmonize facts and sweet words, as he also rebuked Cino da Pistoi about this. The attribute of Virgilian rhetoric, while in accord with this principle, are insufficient, however, to characterize the poetry of the Commedia. If Dante is to reenact allegorically Aeneas' foundational journey and to reincarnate Paul's work, he must take another route. One that both embodies, but yet goes beyond the Virgilian model. A rhetoric that encompasses natural moral truths forms a, necess a necessary but not sufficient basis for making poetry the privileged vehicle of a privileged vision. Grace is needed, as well as a poetics and a language that adheres to divine facts. This poetics, unique to the Commedia, distances Dante from all traditions, from Virgil as from Guido Cavalcanti and his other maggiori, as Dante answered to Bona Giunta, Orpicciani da Lucca implies the definition, self-definition of, of poetry that we find in the next quote. I mi son unche quando amor mi spira noto, e a quel modo che ditta dentro vo significando. The I, io, in line 52, sets the terms that divide Dante from the poets of his youth, of, of his youth from Guittone d'Arezzo to Bonaggiunta Orbicciani, Guido Guinzelli, Arnauto Daniel, but also from the doctrinal magistri, Brunetto Latini and Guido Cavalcanti in particular. This eye records in a temporal dimension and in accord with his laws, the modo uh, what love dictates. The distinguishing character of Dante's poetic work resides in love's inspiration, yes, from external, true, but from within. And in the modality of his signification, according to an order established from without, again, but yet internalized. The term dentro in line 54, inside, cautions the reader against accepting any idea of external objective enlightenment and points to the process 
through which inspiration reemerges from the writer's interiority as poetic artifact. Here is the crucial, distinguished importance of the poet's art. A crucial element intervenes to set Dante's poetry on the other bank of the river of poetry. This natural subjection of the lover to love, his undesired passivity, no longer constitutes a cause for the destruction of the eye, as in Cavalcanti, but becomes instead the principle of his freedom and self-regeneration. Not the author, then, but the scriba who renders intelligible what is not visible. In this act of signifying, the most significando, we find encompassed Dante's distinguishing style and the reason underlying his privileged poetic destiny. The subordination of techne of this art as a process to higher inspiration through the vivifying action of grace is evident in Canto 26 of Aradais, to which we will return, where human language transcends its limits to become theological word a new language in which the historical reality of the signifier and the eternal substance of the signified become one. Next quote. Lo ben che fa contenta questa corte, alfa ed oe di quanta scrittura mi legge amore, o lievemente, o forte. Dante's reply to John's examination of charity, this one I just read, echoes and further clarifies Dante's response to Bonagiunta then, for the love that dictates, dictates is revealed here as the alpha and omega, the alphabetical rationality of the Holy Spirit. In this canto, significantly Dante meets Adam, who represents a human language returned to its primitive order. What words are the sensible manifestation of the essence of things. This language constitutes the highest model for Dante's attempt to fabricate a poetical language that it is the immediate expression of realities, both sensible and divine. In making his language theological, thus Dante becomes almost a new Adam. The encounter with Adam, occur, this encounter occur, occurs at the climax of the passage from a language of visibility to one of invisibility anticipated in Cantus 23 and 24 of Paradise, further exploiting the iconic power of word displayed in Purgatorio 12 and in Paradise 18. In the Canto of Adam, image and word, again, become one language conveying the truths of faith marking Dante's progress from poetry of metaphor toward poetry of vision. This canto marks the extreme limit of what human understanding a human art can achieve after restoration and the rebirth of the new man in the perfection of both natural and theological virtues. Sorry. If the poet is the material instrument, instrument of love, a mediator of the voice of heaven and the artifacts of the visible sign of truth, then his art defines the sphere where he realizes his autonomy and his artistic responsibility. The relationship between the poet and his art becomes essential to understanding how Dante places his art within an eschatological perspective. To this purpose, it is cru crucial then to explore, to explore the model, the how, the mode, of this enlightening art by walking on the terrace of pride along with Virgil and Dante. For in this terrace, Dante addresses explicitly the issue of the relationship between human and divine art. In Purgatorio 10, Dante marvels at the vast reliefs sculpted on the wall, as you remember, displaying a series of examples of humility. The first one shows uh, the Annunciation, the Archangel Gabriel in the act of announcing to the Virgin her divine pregnancy. The scene is more than an image reproducing with extraordinary efficacy the announcement of incarnation. It is made to re-enact that very moment. The Archangel, Dante says, non sembiava immagine che tace, it was not a silent image. And the Virgin appears as immaginata, made into a concrete image that preserved preserves her living substance. Her form, avea in atto impressa esta favela, the word was in, imprinted in the, in the stone, just as figura in cera si suggella, as molded in the wax. The expression is a, a logical as well as a linguistic synesthesia. 
Words are imprinted in the sculpture so that speech become act, giving life to matter in the same way that divine creation enacts the embodiment of the word as image imprinted in matter. The counter insists on this pattern. Uh, the lively panels illustrating the first three examples of humility engage and confuse sight, hear, smell in a sort of babel of senses, a confusion of the languages of the body. The fume or the smoke of the incense invades Dante's eyes and nose so that he doesn't know what his, which sense he's using. I'll see, I'll know, this is fancy. However, this divinely inspired confusion is actually an anti babel episode where languages and signs are fused in a synthesis of representation that anticipates the linguistic metamorphosis of images in Paradise 18. This is the visible speech, the visibile parlare, is the model of divine art the poet Scriba is called upon to imitate. But what are the criteria for achieving such a goal in order thereby to render poetry truly sacred? And what are its limits? The answer to these questions, we need to answer this, to these questions, we need to further explore the idea of artistic work that Dante sketches in Purgatorio 1012. This idea finds its premise, you may remember, Virgil's praise of work in Inferno 11, and an echo in the condemnations, uh, the condemnation of the usurers, for example, as sinners against art, and reaches its culmination in Paradise 25, where Dante links art to the theological virtues. Now, it is not by chance that Dante situates his reflections on art at the beginning of the process of spiritual regeneration in Purgatorio proper. This is indeed the realm of a healing grace, which implies cooperation of the will in the soul's effort to perfect the virtues opposing the wrong inclinations illustrated in the terraces. And these virtues have as their purpose the fulfillment of the law of love that governs purgatorio and tend toward the concrete realization of the Christian commandment of love for God and for others through good works, the Christian praxis. As the pilgrim progress uh, through the terraces toward Eden, we realize the importance, however, not only of works, of actions, but also of art in the healing process that finds its ultimate rationale in the, the theological virtue of charity, which enlightens and guides action toward the other, as we know. It's interesting to uh, connect uh, this uh, uh, aspect of Purgatorio with uh, um, the understanding um, of, for example, Augustine's discussion on the liberal arts in his De Vera Religione. In this book, Augustine stresses the teleological nature of any form of art and condemns the pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake as a deviant form of curiosity. Art should be used as a ladder to ascend, uh, it's a quote, ladder to ascend to immortal and eternal things. And therefore, expression not of frui, but of uti. The same idea seems to me to underlie Dante's cantos of the arts, and emerges in particular in Canto 11 of Purgatorio, where another big issue to define this kind of art is addressed. This canto opens with Dante rewriting, Dante's rewriting of the Lord's Prayer, remember the <coughs> Pater Noster, in which echoes of the Franciscan uh, loud resume. The prayer anticipates the main idea of the canto by stressing the impossibility of the human mind to access the divine and the necessary participation of grace in the process of perfecting virtue. This theme arcs back to the opening lines of Canto 10 that introduce a parallel between divine and human art through the figure of Polycletus. And in this way, Dante establishes a line of ideological continuity between these two cantos. The Greek inventor of the concept of beauty as rule, the inventor of the canon, significant polycletus, obviously, significantly represents the highest achievement of human, human creativity before grace in the mimetic field of sculpture. Read in parallel, though, then the two related openings have framed the theme of excellence of human inventiveness and ingenuity deployed in Canto 11 uh, in, and, in, in a, and set them in a theological perspective. So 
the characters, uh, you may remember he meets uh, three characters, of, uh, three examples of pride, but it's particularly, we concentrate particularly on Oderis da Gubbio, the Illuminator, because it's with him in particular that Dante stages the torment and the failure of the grand desire de Cellenza, the great desire to excel, love for excellence in human terms. The famous sequence of, the, of Tercids, illustrating the examples of vanity and of fame, Giotto di Cimabue, the Tuguidi, the Oderis, Oderis himself, and Franco Bolognese, another illuminator, and this again uh, shows a, a continuity of this pattern of word and image uh, in these cantors, points at the inanity of any desire to excel. Not because human ingenuity can never compete with the divine art of creation, but because time effaces it. Oderisi's words reveal that for him, excellence is something sought out per se, for its sake, for its own sake, which distances him from the Augustine vision of art as usefulness rather than fruition. His vision reveals the limits of human art, marking the boundary that separates techne as a skill from techne as art inspired by grace. Indeed, Oderisi's speech puzzles the reader. In the previous canto, after all, Dante had displayed the model of divine art and implicitly exhorted the pursuit of excellence as a way of achieving similitude between human and divine making. Yet, if we take the word, words literally against uh, uh, this desire of excellence, canto 11 seems to contradict this very idea. What is the point of struggling to achieve excellence in art if time triumphs over fame and nothing remains of what we have created? Oderis di Honor da Gubbio still remembers and values his own grandisio d'eccellenza. And in speaking of Franco Bolognese, who has now surpassed him and as the greatest illuminator of his time, he seems to regret the loss of fame. L'onor è tutto suo, it goes to him only, to me only a little. Uh, even his melancholic meditation on the vanity of greatness shows the limits of his point of view. Glory is as brief as leaves are green, he says, unless, again he says, an age of decadence and darkness follows. O vana gloria dell'umane posse, con poco, con poco verde in sulla cima dura, se non è giunta dalle tati grosse. Which is the text of what I just said. Only when later artists are, are inferior can one's greatness endure. He seems to regret having lived in a time of technical progress when new ideas and discoveries brought to superior achievements and oblivion has then submerged those who had planted the seeds others are now bring it to full blow. In the simile of the green leaves, two dimensions of time overlap, the time of natural ages and the time that measures in a non-linear way the development of human knowledge. Neither is included in a vision of eternal time where art plays a role in enabling access to salvation. Oderisi has not yet achieved the full comprehension of the eschatological dimension of art that the comedia itself represents. His conversion, moral conversion, has earned him his place in Purgatorio, but he still maintains a secular sense of fame and excellence, which is evident in the negative prophecy he delivers to Dan that nobody will you know, remember here in a thousand years, which we know is not true. How do we reconcile Roderiz's plan, a lament, with the general perspective of work in Purgatorio and the Commedia? Can the implicit contradiction between desire to excel and the necessity of humility find a solution? Its very existence of this contradiction suggests that the suppression of the natural desire to seek excellence is not necessarily expression of virtue, but may become a form of pusillanimity condemned by Dante in Convivio. To utterly renounce this desire means ultimately despising God's gifts, and an abdication to fully realize human potentialities. Rather than an absolute condemnation of fame, the canto, uh, this Canto 11 does seem to suggest a medium between pride and pusillanimity. And the figure of Order Easy is important in this respect because 
he signals the brim of the abyss on which the artist stands, the abyss of self-idolatry. Art as, as successful imitation of divine creation relies on the poet's capacity to see in his work the imprint of the divine and to recognize himself and his art as instruments at the service of the providential design. Only under these conditions can art become cooperation with grace. And perhaps those works of art are so inspired may last as scripture lasts, for they are not just evidence of the greatness of the, greatness of the human mind, but revelations of the divine operating in the world through his creature, God's creatures. And that not all desire for excellence leads to pride was a main point in Aquinas' treatment of this vice. And the question of 162 in, in Article 1 of the Summa Theologia Secunda Secunde, drawing on Isidore and Augustine, he defines pride as an inordinate, quote, inordinate desire of one's own excellence, and links it, like Augustine in the Civitate Dei, to a deviant desire to imitate God. So, deviant, so it means there is a right one. Immoderate appetite for glory derives, derives from an excess of right reason that prevails when someone, quote from a, uh, Aquinas, thinks he has from himself that which he has from God, or when he believes that which he has received from above to be due to his own merits. Oderisi seems to symbolize this definition of pride, which stands in opposition also to art as intellectual virtue which Aquinas himself defines as the right reason about certain works to be made. Desire to excel, however, so uh, can be ordinate when it implies acknowledgement and respect of the natural limits of the self. And in this perspective, that of Aquinas and Augustine, but also Dante, only inordinate, irrational pride stands in opposition to humility. And humility, we have to remember, is a virtue that sets the boundaries of right pride and, according to Aquinas, is the vir virtue that ranks below only the theological virtues, the intellectual virtues and justice. So from this theological perspective, it becomes a, a vital then uh, and a premise to all this discourse on art that detachment uh, of the author the artist in which the principle of art inheres and his work, his created object of art in which similitude with God becomes visible and through which humans are able to appreciate the gifts divinity has bestowed on them. In logical sequence, the Canto 12 offers examples of such humble art, where excellence is sought in imitation of visible speaking. Virgil exhorts Dante to keep his eyes fixed on the ground as they hasten to the next terrace to look at the sequence of bas reliefs, again, sculpted on a pathway and depicting examples of punished pride. And as we follow in Dante's footsteps, we realize that the initial letters of the 12 examples form the acrostic warm man, repeated in the three verses of the last verse that talks about uh, the destruction of the proud Troy the city. As the sequence of images displaying legendary acts of pride unfolds, the text itself becomes a meta sign, making visible the essence of humility by reminding the reader of what humanity often forgets in striving for greatness, that we are just human beings, we are not gods. This visible mark on the text, the acrostic, exemplifies the model of divine art on the pages of the Commedia. And at the end of Dante's purification on the terrace of pride, this apparent paradox we were talking before between the vanity of fame and the imperative search for artistic excellence dissolves in this sense. The intellectual detachment of the author from his work, his office as scriba, allows him to reaffirm the necessity and us usefulness of the desire for excellence, while at the same time prevents him from falling a victim of the risk of idolatry, of his own work. So more than awkwardly adopting a strategy of dissimulation uh, and self-promotion, Dante is here interrogating the power and the limits of human creativity as co-work with divine creation. 
And Dante's reflection on artistic uh, creation achieves its climax in Canto 25 of Paradiso, as I mentioned before. A canto that interlaces all the different thematic threads we have examined up to this point. This canto opens with reference to Dante's state of exile and hope to return to Florence and be crowned poet laureate. His existential condition is placed at the center of St. Peter and St. James' examinations on faith and hope, thus implicitly establishing a connection between Dante's own personal experience and the theology of virtue Dante illustrates through the examinations. From his exile, Dante does not simply voice his desire to return to Florence. He states that, should it, should it ever happen, it would be because of his poem. You have the long uh, quotation. Uh, this is the opening of Canto 25. I will read in the Italian. Se mai continga che il poema sacro al quale ha posto mano e cielo e terra, si che m'ha fatto per molti anni macro, vinca la crudeltà che fuor mi serra, del bello vilo vio dormi agnello, nemico ai lupi che li danno guerra, Con altra voce ormai, con altro vello, ritornerò poeta e sul fonte del mio battesimo prenderò il cappello. Should he return to Florence, he would enter again the communities of the church and the city by taking his hat, sign of citizenship and uh, belonging to the church, at the site where he was baptized, symbolically recalling his spiritual and moral rebirth after his journey to the celestial city. His sacred poem, the product of so much work for so many years, might then overcome the cruelty of his enemies and reopen the doors of his beautiful sheepfold. The Commedia itself acts here as the force that inspires Dante's hope. His longing to return to Florence parallels his longing to return to the celestial homeland and his work is at the center of both journeys. Why is the product of his labors placed here at the crossroad of the examinations on faith and hope? At this point in his voyage, Dante has already displayed the essential principles of his theology of work, but it is in paradise that he finally achieves the status of Scriba Dei and receives, as it were, his laurel as the author of a poem in whose making earth and heaven have joined forces. As Scriba Dei, he is in the Pauline sense a divine co-worker, a sunergos, who writes under love's dictation what he has seen. Although his work earns him, him hope, the dangers of idolatry, again, have not, however, completely disappeared. As St. James questions him on the nature of hope, in three uh, different questions, Beatrice anticipates his pupil's reply and answers directly to the second question, what is, you know, that makes you hope. She vigorously affirms that none exists in the militant church who has more hope than Dante. Why so? At first, her intervention seem, seems redundant. Why would Dante not be able to answer this question himself? And why would the other two points be less difficult? the altri due punti, that Beatrice leaves to him, because the other two will not be difficult and neither cause of yattanza, which is boasting pride. The second question is indeed more difficult because hope does not depend entirely on faith here, but also on previously acquired merit, about which Dante can have no knowledge at this point. Moreover, because he has not written the poem yet, in theory. Moreover, Beatrice says, to answer this question could present Dante with an occasion to boast these yattans. So in protecting Dante from the risk of pride, Beatrice indirectly evidences the relationship between hope and Dante's poem, and then reaffirms the uniqueness of Dante's poetry. But again, Dante also answers to the first question then, what is hope? And in his, uh, in his answer, we see clarified its affiliation between his poem and hope. Spene di Sio, uh, the following uh, quotation, è uno attender certo della gloria futura, il qual produce grazia divina 
e precedente merito, the merit acquired before. The definition of hope in, ter in terms of grace and merit acquired through good works anticipates and extends the St. James doctrine of salvation. In his epistle, the apostle St. James had written, quote, do you see that by works a man is justified and not by faith only? The context of, of the canto suggests that this merit refers not just to action, not just to human agency, but also as well to art. A claim here that complements that idea of art that we have seen illustrated in Purgatorio before. Together with David, uh, Dante indicates who, who are the sources of his uh, you know, hope, David's Theodia, the, uh, and also the mover of the Ark, uh, an element on which we can talk later uh, for uh, want of time. Uh, but it is St. James, the main source uh, to whom Dante refers, and to his pistola. And again, we have this quote, uh, uh, which is the following one on your handout. Uh, the author of the pistola, St. James, who filled him with so much hope that he can now pour, pour it forth to others. Tu mi stillasti con lo stillar tuo nella pistola, poi sì che son pieno, e in altrui vostra pioggia repluo. This altrui, the others. The biblical image of the rain gives the sense of a continuity established between the sacred words of James, David, and Dante's own poem. Since faith is the substance, uh, the definition of faith uh, in Canto 24, substance of things hoped for from St. Paul, then the commedia, the poem, gives hope insofar as it substantiates his hope of uh, to return to his homeland as well as to his earthland, uh, Florence. Um, and this is just not for the writer, but also for its readers, the others upon which the rain pours. The most striking fact about James' epistle is that it is not so much about hope at all, I mean, also, but not mainly, it is about the necessity of works as substance and evidence of faith. In the canon, it follows Paul's letters, letter to the Hebrews and was considered a sort of critical complement to this letter, to Paul's letter. While the letter to the, the epistle to the Hebrew, in, in this epistle to the um, Hebrews, Paul affirms that faith, faith is the sole source of justification. James, on the contrary, asserts that without words, faith has no effect. Since the canonization of James' epistle, these two positions have been judged as contradictory. And his, in his letter 167, a short treatise commenting James, Augustine tried to reconcile Paul and James' positions on the importance of words for justification by interpreting it in terms of realization of charity. For both Paul and James, charity represented the highest of virtue in terms of perfection and the one that subsumes all others. Charity is love for God and neighbor. It cannot exist without faith, and it gains no hope without words. Paul and James' visions thus converge in the superior perspective of the necessity of work for the perfection of virtue in view of salvation. Augustine's letter seems relevant to the relationship between moral and productive actions and charity we find in Dante. Equally relevant is the influence of James on Franciscan spirituality, which we have seen it seeps through, which constitutes another important medium of the idea of works as concrete realization of the Christian commandment, love thy neighbor. The two converging perspectives, the Augustinian and the Franciscan, inform the text of Paradiso 25, where Dante seems to reread James through both these authors the idea of art, and the discussion of the problematic relationship between desire of excellence and humility displayed in the purgatorial cantos of pride, thus prepared us, uh, prepared the terrain for this discussion in Paradiso 25, where Dante moves a step forward in connecting not only praxis through his own poem, but also poiesis to the virtue of charity. And to accomplish this, 
he needed, as we know, to neutralize that risk of self-idolatry. And that is why it was at the center of those cantos of art. Because only when such risk is curbed can art become the product of divine and human cooperation. And at the very moment, it pursues, however, imitation of God's creation, of God's making. Only then can the visible word adhere to and offer itself as the medium of invisible truth at the service of its readers. In advancing their understanding and in moving them to pursue virtue, the poem becomes similar to an act, to an action that realizes the Christian law of charity. So the essential character of art as realization of charity is, uh, as we know, and by now, uh, explicit in that uh, uh, answer to James' uh, question in Paradiso 26 to John, the apostle of the theological language of word and vision, <clears throat> in which Dante paraphrases uh, the apocalypse. The, in, in, the, in the Tercet that we could, I quoted before, lo ben che fa contenta questa corte di alfa e omega, è di quanta scrittura of the, that writing, that scripture, uh, that love reads to me, either low or aloud. In this Tercet, we observe that Dante brings together John's alphabetical metaphor of God as alpha and omega of the scripture, and the image of love as reader and therefore dictator that we find in the definition of Dante's uh, poetry in Purgatorio 24. So in this way, Dante links his destiny of poet to the universal divine discourse of creation and places his own art at the very center of the definition of charity. If Aristotle had brought art into ethics and made of it an intellectual virtue, Dante built on the ethical essence of Aristotelian art to include both praxis and techne, action and art, within the same theological domain of charity. Through James' theology of work, read in the spirit of Augustine and Francis, Dante moves to a theology of techne whereby he reformulates and reenacts Virgil's aesthetic ethic word while at the same time transcending it within an eschatological dimension. It is an idea of art that we will find again later at the heart of the humanist thought and from this heart the Renaissance flower will bloom. Thank you.